Well, we had so much fun up here decorating the church for Christmas yesterday, didn't we? Yeah. And it looks beautiful. And BJ and Jerome, you should have seen these guys. They were up on ladders, yeah. hanging these beautiful lights in the back. And I heard a rumor, BJ, that we even ran out of lights here and that you ran back to the house and or let us borrow some of yours. You are awesome, sir. Thank you, guys. <laughs> And they have taken on that audiovisual ministry, and they are so very faithful with it. Yeah. We sure appreciate you guys. Y'all are helping lead us in worship. We're so, so thankful. Are there any other announcements that need to come before this body, before we dive in to the Word today? It's a good day. It's a good day. I'm glad you all are here. I'm glad for those of you who are watching us online that you're joining us, whether it's Today or this afternoon or this week or in a year, we're glad you're here. And I think the Lord has a word for all of us today. Yeah. And incidentally, it's about Christmas lights. I like Christmas lights. There's just something about them. I like Christmas lights. They're awesome. They're beautiful. It reminds me that the light is coming. The light is coming. And I think we set a world record in the Reed House because the day after Thanksgiving, we got our whole house decorated for Christmas. We got inside and out. And it was probably a record because we, we stayed home for Thanksgiving. We had time and space to be able to do that. World record. It was awesome. And it was so fun getting all that stuff out of the attic and you know, just pulling things out that we've forgotten about. And, oh, how special is this? And putting this in place and getting the kids involved and... It was just so much fun. And our house, it's simple, but it's beautiful. And like we decorated here yesterday. You know, we, we all came together and, and worked for a couple hours. It was a lot of fun. And our church looks different because of it. It's beautiful. I, I think it's beautiful. There's just something so special about decorating for Christmas. And, and last night after dinner, we threw the kids into the car. We very safely buckled them, of course. And we just drove around a few neighborhoods, and we looked at Christmas lights, and oh my goodness, they loved it. Uh, Wesley's seat is right behind where I was, I was driving, and he would see something go, oh look, Daddy, there's another one, I see Christmas lights. It's just so excited every time, like it was brand new, because the light is coming. And even a little bit of light drives out darkness. Have you ever been in a room that's dark? There's one candle lit. It's amazing how much light can come from one little candle that's lit. And in the same way, it's amazing how much a house sticks out. So this is our house. And it's simple. It's very simple. But I, I think it's so pretty. And it's, it's warming. And you see Wesley was running up the driveway there. This picture on the bottom right is our block. And you see there's some other porch lights on, but there are no other Christmas lights. Well, thank you. It really makes our house stick out. When I drive home and it's dark, I turn onto our block, it's just glowing. It's beautiful to me, and it's so stark. It's amazing what a little light can do. And that's what we're gonna be talking about. The next two or three weeks, I haven't totally decided yet, but we're going to be talking about the light is coming. It's going to be an Advent sermon series because Jesus is the light of the world. And in this season of waiting, of preparing our hearts, we remember that the light is coming. And so today, we're going to dive into John chapter 1, verse, verses 1 through 18. And this is one of the most dense sections in all of Scripture. There is so much that John says in a really short space. So many lofty and heavy theological doctrines come from this passage. And honestly, we could do an entire sermon series on this one passage, but for today, we're, we're going to look at the whole thing. We're just going to step back and take a broad look at what this is saying about Jesus and the coming light. And so we'll only hit the really high points of this today. Why don't we pray before we dive into this? Mm -hmm. 
Not my words today, but yours, Father. Jesus, you are the light of the world. And you are coming. And you are coming again. God, in this season, help us pause. Help us look to you with expectation, with hope, with confidence. And thank you that somehow you enable us to become the light of the world as well. And that our small lights can light up a street. God, bless this word today. Speak to us. Open our hearts and our minds. Help us make room for you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. So this is maybe a little bit small. I wanted to get it all in one slide, though, because I'll read it, and then I'm just going to kind of walk us through it bit by bit. So John 1, 1 through 18 says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Seriously, we could preach on that and nothing else for today. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness, to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. These first verses echo the opening of Genesis. It talks about the beginning of all of time and space. Jesus has always been, and everything was created through him. The New Living Translation says, in the beginning the word already existed, and I like that. Jesus is pre-existent. From the beginning of eternity past, Jesus has always been. And there's always been distinction in the Godhead. We're already getting glimpses of the Trinity. Now Matthew and Luke open their Gospels with genealogies. They show Jesus' humanity. They trace his lineage back through David, further. But John doesn't do that. John focuses on his eternal nature. And that's important that we get both. Because Jesus is divinity and humanity together. Now, this Greek term for the word, it's logos. And in this setting, it's conveying the notion of divine speech, of divine self-expression. And it has a really rich Old Testament background. It was brilliant. It was a brilliant word that built a bridge between John and the Hebrews who would be reading his gospel and also the Gentiles who would be reading his gospel. It was a, it was a big word in both cultures. But John doesn't just use the same word, he elevates it. He shows that 
the word, meaning Jesus, is higher and richer than the Greek understanding of logos, which the Greeks kind of understood it very philosophically. It was, it was like a, a sort of divine structure for philosophy, for morality, but it was very impersonal. And it was very reason-oriented. But God's word is powerful and it's intimate. Remember, God speaks and it is made. He says, let there be light. And there was. But in the same breath, God spoke from the cloud at Mount Sinai and all the people there heard his voice. He spoke to them the Ten Commandments, which incidentally, we call them the Ten Commandments. The Hebrews don't call them that. They call them the Ten Words. That word, word, has a rich history. The word was with God, showing dynamic relationship. And the word also is God, showing unity, showing distinction, all at the same time in the Godhead. What an incredible mystery. This idea of the Trinity that we're already catching glimpses of. It says, he made everything that is, the entire universe. And nothing that has been made was made without him. In fact, everything was made through him, the word, which shows us that God speaks, God the Father speaks, and then God the Son, the word, carries it out. Now, in verses 4 and 5, it switches gears a little bit. It says, in him was life. And that life was the light of men. Now, light symbolizes true knowledge, moral purity, and wisdom, which, which is a whole lot more than just being smart or intelligent. Wisdom, in the way the Hebrews understood it, was a whole lot more about being able to know and do that which is right. Go reread Proverbs thinking about it like that, not the way that, that we more think of wisdom today. And Jesus carries these forth perfectly along with the light of the very presence of God. And it says that that light is true life for all. Just like there's darkness in need of light, so is there life that is not true life. And we must choose very wisely and very carefully what we reach for that we think is life. Paul exhorts Timothy to take hold of the life that is truly life. And John talks a lot about life and light in his gospel, and Jesus is both. Light has shined in the darkness, and the darkness has not understood or, more accurately, overcome it, and it never, ever will. No matter how dark things look in this world around us, the light is coming, and the light will always win. Then in verse 6, there's a major gear shift. He tells us that John was sent as a witness to this light. This is, this is some of that courtroom kind of imagery, witness, testifying to the truth. So we're jumping out of eternity into a really specific time and place. And this is about John the Baptist, not about the Apostle John who writes the gospel. He never names himself in his gospel. But John the Baptist was not the light. But he pointed to the light in everything he did. He really had opportunity to promote himself. People wanted him to be the Messiah. But he wouldn't do it. He chose the way of humility. He only pointed to Jesus. And friends, that image of John just pointing to Jesus has stuck with me for so many years. And I've prayed that prayer with so many, so many different gatherings of worship teams before we get to lead God's people in worship. I've prayed that before Bible studies. I've prayed that before sermons because that's my heart. 
I only want to point the way to Jesus. If, if you leave here today or if you watch this online and you, you just say, wow, that Matthew sure is smart and he can put together a good message, I failed. I have failed because I only want to point the way to Jesus. And Miranda, in the same way, if, if we leave here and go, wow, Miranda sure can sing and play what she really, really can, we failed. We've missed our mark because our heart is just to point people to Jesus. We want to get out of the way. We want to point people to Jesus. He says the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And that's the idea that I'm kind of honing in on today. That the light is coming. He was already here in a very real sense because he'd made everything. And his spirit was already here. But even though he made everything, the world didn't know him. And then his very own people, the Jews, did not know him. They didn't receive him. They rejected him. God, help us not miss you. It's important to note here that in John's gospel, he uses the words knowing, receiving, and believing almost interchangeably. They mean different things. They nuance different things. But it's the same basic idea. It says in verse 12, but to those who did receive him, he received him. He gave them the right to become children of God. And receive implies more than just agreeing to something in my mind. It's, it's about welcome, opening the doors wide implies submission for one who is greater than I is here. And it says believe in his name and this also shows that we have to trust in the whole person and work of Jesus. It's not just checking a box in our mind and going on with our lives as normal. Jesus can't just be a good moral teacher or an example we try to follow. He is both of those things but he's the Christ of God. And we must welcome and trust and surrender every bit of our lives to him. Those who believe reminds us that saving faith comes before the free gift of adoption into God's family. God loves us so much. He loves the whole world, right? But he doesn't force it on us. He gives us the grace to choose. Let us choose well, friends. Let us choose well. And this idea of being adopted into God's family, it's not, it's not a family based on ethnic descent or human effort or human choice. But it's a free gift of God to all who call on his name. We're getting glimpses of the gospel embracing more than just the Jewish people group for the whole world. And then verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I think that's the most stunning statement ever written. <laughs> Again, we could park there for days. The eternal became human. The divine took on flesh. And the word in here, it speaks more about the idea of God putting on humanity, like you and I would put on an extra coat if it's cold, rather than God giving up divinity. The humanity is an addition to his divinity, not a replacement for it. I like this. Dwelt among us, the Greek for that, it's literally pitched his tent. Which that language takes us back to the back into those Old Testament passages about the manifestation of God's presence and his glory. Think about the temple, I mean the tabernacle being so filled with the cloud of God's glory that Moses couldn't even go in. That's Exodus 40:35, if you want to look that up. His Shekinah glory filled the place. Lord, would you come? 
with your spirit so richly. And this glory is now resting in the person of Jesus, the only Son of God. And this language about being a son, it's, it's more than just like we think of genetic offspring, like the list of genealogies, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. This is more, more like an imprint. It's an, it's an imprint of the Father in terms of his likeness, of who he is, of his attributes, of what he's about. More than it is about a lineage. Because remember, Jesus was with God at the beginning. He created all things. So the Son is revealing to us in the flesh who the Father is. And it says we have seen His glory in a way that only the Son could reveal. And it says full of grace and truth. And this reminds us of two beautiful Hebrew words. Chesed, which is steadfast love, and emet, which is faith. These were, these were critical words for how the Hebrews understood God. That God is very faithful. That he has a, a love that is steadfast, so much more steadfast than my fickle human love. He has a love that is not based on our performance. And he's faithful even when we fall down. And Jesus is full of grace and truth. It's almost like a perfect mirror. God's grace is unmerited favor. It's a gift. And it says from his fullness that we have all received grace upon grace. It's an incredible abundance. And that was truth. But none of us could ever keep the law perfectly enough to fully be right with God for all time. So that's why the advent of Jesus is a special grace upon grace. Lowell does not like that one. <laughs> Jesus is also the full intersection of grace and truth. So this is who John the Baptist was pointing to, just in case there was any question. But John was actually born physically before Jesus was and even entered into public ministry before Jesus did. Yet John always says that Jesus ranks higher because he was before him. And that John wasn't even worthy to untie Jesus' sandal. It says that no one has ever fully seen God before, but they now see him through Jesus. And that line about making him known, it's where we get the modern word exegesis which is a really fancy word for preaching. It's the process of interpreting the scriptures and proclaiming them, of declaring them. It's what I'm doing right now. So the idea there is that Jesus' very life declares the word of God, for he's the word made flesh. My friends, the light is coming. And from where is the light coming? It's coming from eternity coming from divinity. The light comes from God, and the light is God. And it's coming down into this world of darkness to bring us back to Him. And in this season of waiting and hope, we will do well to prepare our hearts to make room, to slow down. Because you know what? It doesn't matter how pretty my house looks. Maybe my house does light up the street. But if I don't have the Lord's light in my heart and my life, it's empty. Mm -hmm. And our church is beautiful. But if it's only beautiful on the walls and on the outside, if we're not aglow with the Spirit of God, then it's empty. I love that old Christmas hymn, Joy to the World. It says, let every heart prepare him room. Just like there was no room at the busy inn, 
so we want to make room in our busy hearts. And I don't know what that looks like for you this Advent season. Maybe it looks like putting something down for a while. Maybe turning off Facebook, putting your phone down, turning off the TV. Maybe it means giving something up for a season so that you can more richly experience the presence of Christ. Maybe it means taking something extra on, like joining our Advent Zoom Bible study every Wednesday at 7.30. Let me know if you want a link and I'll get one for you. Hey. <laughs> Maybe it's spending more time in the Word on purpose. Maybe it's reading through some of those prophecies. Maybe it's reading through the birth story. Taking that journey with Mary and Joseph. Maybe it means getting up a little extra early to spend time in prayer. I don't know what that looks like for you. I encourage all of us, though, to prepare our hearts to make room. And not just because of a beautiful one in that. God, would you forgive us for getting so busy that we lose sight of you? We can get so focused on for all the people we love or all the right food we're doing in this busy season. God, slow us down. Help us make room for you. Lord, thank you for sending your light into the darkness. And thank you that you then call us your light as well. 